Sorry it took long to get. Sorry it took so long to get. Sorry it took looks. Sorry it took so long to get this installment out, I've been doing a lot of other videos lately. But it's time for part 3 in the Ramps 3D Control Board series. And today I'm going to talk about 5.08mm 3-pin single level right angle plug-in screw type PCB terminal block hot wire connectors. Or as they are more colloquially known, those stupid green plug things. So the first thing we're going to talk about is specifications. Now the official spec for these, as it were, is around 15 amps. And if you watched the previous installment where I dealt with MOSFETs, you know that that's typically a pretty good range. Obviously the higher the better, but your bed's unlikely to pull more current than that. If you're unsure, go check out that video and do the math just to be on the safe side. Now the problem isn't these green connectors themselves. The problem is that a lot of these green connectors use underrated parts because they're cheaper. Or they'll use parts with no specification at all and you really don't know what you're going to get. For example, this one that I marked 10A on, I can see clearly on the side it says that it's marked at 10 amps and 300 volts. This one on the other hand is completely unmarked and I have absolutely no idea what kind of current it can handle. And then I have this other one that you probably can't make out, but it does have the manufacturer written on there and it has an actual part number that you can go and look up a data sheet and see what it is that it's going to be able to handle. So that's the first thing I want to cover, the actual ratings of the part. Now these are fairly cheap. If you happen to buy a ramps board that has an unmarked connector or one that's rated a bit too low for your heated bed, you can just go to Mauser, Digikey, Arrow, RS, whatever, and find one that has a sufficient current rating. Now, what exactly is going on with these that makes them fail? The biggest problem we have is that they just heat up and they melt down, or they catch fire. Obviously, that's not desirable. And that really falls into three categories. The manufacturer could be lying about its specs, it could be unspecced, or it could be user error. So let's touch on those briefly. Different metals have different resistivity. That is, how much they impede the flow of electrons. We went through Ohm's law in previous videos, so the one that is going to be of concern to us right now is the calculations for power, and that's power equals current squared times resistance, and the resistance is going to be key. Each of these blocks has plug connectors at the end, as well as clamp connectors for the input, and then a screw terminal on the top. The material of the screw terminal isn't crucial, but the material of the pins and the material of the clamp, that's vital. The surface area is also very important, but that's set dependent on the pin distance. And on the plug, we also have to consider the amount of material there. The pin side that's going to receive this, that's soldered to the PCB, pretty much has a set diameter as well. But again, those pins can be different materials. Usually what we use in electronics is copper. The problem with copper is that it oxidizes, and that oxide coating has much higher resistivity than the metal itself. If you get a cheapy part, it might be copper that's coated with nickel. If you get a slightly better part, it might be copper that's coated with zinc. And if you get a fancy schmancy part, it'll be copper that's coated with gold or copper that's coated with nickel and the nickel is coated with gold. Now, some of these uber cheapy parts, they won't even use copper. And it may or may not say in the data sheets what it actually uses, but it could be brass or bronze, or it could just be straight up steel. And that's gonna be your worst case scenario. A lot of cheaper components are just made out of steel and then they tin it with something that's a little bit less likely to be corroded. But in any current carrying capacity where you're going to see small diameters like PCB mount parts, you really don't want steel in there. And a lot of cheapy things are made of steel. Like these alligator clips, these were uber cheapies. Obviously, they're sticking to this magnet, they're steel. These crap tabulous resistors that I got from China, steel. Even these pin headers, also steel. Now these little green monsters, they are going to stick to a magnet, but that's hopefully just the screws. The actual flat terminals inside are not magnetic, and if they are, don't use it. So that covers specifications, that covers the materials that could go wrong. Now let's talk about user error. But wait, before we talk about how you should and should not be plugging things into these connectors, 
The number one reason these melt down is just because you're sucking too much current through it. Now I'm not going to go back into the math covering all the ins and outs of how much current you can and can't suck through these and why and which beds will pull which current and all that kind of stuff. I cover that really thoroughly in the MOSFET videos. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to leave that out here and just say please go check those out first. And then once you've made sure that you spec your bed properly for your connectors, then we can worry about how we can hook them up right. As I alluded to when I was mentioning Ohm's Law, the biggest issue we are going to have is our resistance. Obviously our current is going to be whatever our current is going to be to feed our bed and it's going to try to pull that no matter if it can or if it can't. Now think of electricity as running water through a tube. If you have a large diameter tube it's easy for a lot of water to flow through there. Same with electrons. You have a lot more electrons that you can move that current with. But if all of a sudden that tube tapers down and you have a smaller area, you're restricting the flow a lot more. That's your resistivity. And the byproduct of that is that it's going to produce heat. Now when we see these connectors melting down, it's because more heat equals higher resistance equals even more heat, which equals even higher resistance, which equals more heat, so on and so forth, until something catastrophic happens. And that's because the resistivity of metals goes up when they get warm. And not all metals are equal. Some metals rise much more slowly than others, and some are linear. Others have more of a parabolic curve. For example, copper is good, gold is good, but zinc or steel, not good. Unfortunately, those materials are more expensive, so therefore the plugs are a little bit more expensive. So when you buy the three to five dollar ramps boards off of Ally Express, you're not going to get the nice stuff usually. We have another problem that there are several different types of rating systems. You can have UL or the Underwriters Laboratory, or you can have IEC, which is the International Electrotechnical Commission, I think, or something like that. IEC specifies the minimum safety standards, whereas UL ratings, they take into account specific usage. So a lot of times, if you look up the data sheets for one of these connectors, you will see an IEC rating and a UL rating, and usually the UL rating is going to be much lower. So you could have one of these terminals that's actually within the confines of the way that we're going to be using them should honestly be rated at 10 amps and it could be IEC rated at 15 amps and as a result they might sell it as a 15 amp connector. So that's just another thing to be careful of. The big power cables that we run into these are typically not solid wire, it's typically stranded wire and some people will make the mistake of doing what's called tinning or full tinning where you take the end of a wire and you tin it with a soldering iron by just melting it until it's absorbed into all the strands that makes it solid and then they plug that in which is a bad idea for these connectors and that can lead to some of the meltdown. The reason for that is you have cold and you have hot problems. There's a thing called cold creep where since you have the two different types of metals and you're compressing it since the other is tin and lead which is very soft that's eventually going to flatten out and move out. Then you have thermal expansion and contraction especially when you're talking about a solid that's now essentially bimetallic. Those are going to be moving at different rates and you're going to have problems down the road. So there's the first thing that you can do or not do to help the problem. Don't fully tin your wires before you put them in. It is okay if you just want to put tin on the very end to keep them from fraying, but don't really blob it on. Just use enough to keep them from coming out and then definitely twist the wires. You want to take those stranded wires and simulate a solid wire as best you can. But even better is to use these guys, which is just a wire ferrule. This happens to be an insulated wire ferrule. They come in uninsulated as well. These usually go with the European pin type connectors that we're using on these boards. We don't see a lot of these in American equipment because we use different terminal types here but 3D printers use all the Euro stuff, so just get used to the idea. I worked for several years at a company that uh, designed and built industrial control enclosures, and those had, and some of those jobs I worked for European companies doing their subcontracted manufacturing in America for whatever factories they had going on here. Now their standards, I think, the most annoying one was a Swedish company that used German standards and the wire it had a particular kind of wire, they had a particular kind of wire label that got wrapped around it. They specified certain pins. Every single wire had to be pinned, that had to go into the terminal block, it had a particular curvature and the label had to be rotated to see it in a certain way. It made serviceability very nice, it made manufacturing a big pain in my butt for months on end. But 
They avoid any of the bimetallic cold and hot creep problems with these ferrules. It keeps the strands from fraying. It just makes things much nicer altogether. And in addition to those physical problems that I told you about, the, the fraying and the creep and that type of thing, thermal expansion, there's also an electronic problem that we have or an electrical problem that we have, and that's called contact resistance. Now, any metal that touches another metal, unless that's soldered on there, you have resistance between those two. You want that to obviously be as low as possible, especially if we're trying to transmit a lot of current through something, because as we said with Ohm's law, the higher resistance, the higher power we're gonna be dissipating into heat, the hotter our joint's gonna be, we start that chain reaction, everything melts. But if we're talking about wire that doesn't use a ferrule, you have a couple basic problems. First, you're, you have your stranded wire, you're flattening that out, and not all of these wires on the edges are gonna be in contact, so you're not taking advantage of the entire diameter of your wire. And if you remember our analogy of the tube, you're basically making it a slightly smaller tube. Second problem is oxidation. But we do know copper does oxidize pretty readily, and since we can't tin it because of the creep, you're going to get oxidation in there. And that's been measured over a two to three year period of increasing between three and five times. If you've had this printer around for a while, you might run into a case where if you're using bare stranded copper wire that's just clamped in there, you frayed and frayed and frayed over the years, plus oxidation is coming in, you have much higher resistivity you did before, and eventually it's gonna melt your terminal blocks. And it goes without saying, use wire that's rated for the current you're going to be passing through it. Here's a box of generic crimps that I got from Crimps R Us or whoever on Amazon, as well as this crimping tool, which was actually pretty cheap, and I'll put a link to it in the description of the video. Now, all you have to do is strip it back as you would normally, and there are particular lengths that you're supposed to strip this off to, as you can see here. Then make sure you don't have any fray wires going on. Pick your proper ferrule size, slide it over the wire, and just crimp it right in place. It'll make a nice square section solid connector that'll match your plug. And then just give it a little tug to make sure that it's really on there. So that's part three of the ramp series. Thanks for watching. I'll get to part four whenever I can. I don't remember what part four it is. I think it's poly fuses and regular fuses. So that, that'll be a hoop holler in good time. But same deal as always, click like, ring the bell for notifications, tell your friend about the page, blah, 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 all that stuff. Support links are down in the description. I would dearly appreciate you checking those out and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, get out there and make something awesome.